The key to be awesomely effective is to work with biology. Whether we love or hate our jobs, the amount of work most of us have to do each day has reached unsustainable levels. We start a typical workday anxious about how we will get it all done, who we might let down, and which important tasks we will sacrifice, again, so we can keep our heads above water. As we grab our first cups of coffee, we check our email inboxes on our handheld devices, scanning to see who has added a new task to our to-do list. The stress builds as we read email after email, each containing a request that we know can't be dealt with quickly. We mark these emails as unread and save them for later. We mentally add them to the piles of work left undone the night before when we left our offices much too late. More emails to answer, more phone calls to return, more paperwork to fill out. And everything needs our immediate attention. In fact, too many things need our attention before we can even get to the tasks that really matter, and too many things matter. We frequently work all day long, at the office and then at home, taking care of our families, cleaning up, paying bills, sometimes only stopping to sleep. There simply isn't enough time, but so much always needs to be done. Other time, management experts advise us to get to what matters most first, because there may not be enough time for those tasks later. Yes, it's valuable to separate the truly important from the urgent the less important. But there's something frustrating about this advice. When all's said and done, there are still a lot of things we have to do that are not the most important on the list. Some things matter because they affect our relationships, some because not doing them will, in the long run, get us fired, some because we agreed to a deadline and we can't flake just because something else important is on that list. Even if these tasks are not what matters most, we may still go home feeling anxious when we don't complete them. Sure, some problems go away if we ignore them. We can get better at letting things go. But with many of our tasks, we will not be absolved of responsibility for them. Eventually, they need to get done. If a lack of efficiency were truly the problem, most of us, including my accomplished clients, would have solved our problems by now. Choosing the right system or app to help us manage our time or prioritize our tasks would relieve the pressure of the daily grind. But quantity and capacity are not the only factors that matter, and despite working as efficiently as possible, we are still not satisfied. Many of us feel stifled rather than accomplished at the end of a typical day. While helping high-level executives and professionals become more effective, I've learned that regardless of how high up the ladder we are, we typically respond to being overwhelmed by work in two ways. One is to force ourselves to stay on task without breaks in order to make the most efficient use of our days. The other is to work more hours, and to ask anyone who works for us to do so too, to make the most efficient use of our weeks. Underlying both of these solutions is the belief that to manage our workload, we should stop wasting time, we should be efficient. This belief follows from a fundamental misunderstanding of how our brains work. Staying on task without a break and working longer hours are wonderful solutions for a computer or a machine. Computers and machines don't get tired, so the quality of work is identical every time they are used. Using them more frequently will only lead to greater productivity and efficiency. But, of course, we're not computers or machines. We are biological creatures. Continually demanding one kind of work, and a consistent level of effectiveness, from our brains is like continually demanding the same speed from a runner under any circumstances, whether sprinting or competing in a marathon, or whether running with no sleep after fasting for a day, jogging after recovering from a hangover, or exercising after being fed and rested. There are consequences of being biological creatures on how we think. A number of people in the scientific community call these consequences embodied cognition. Embodied cognition includes the many ways that having a body influences thought. The brain serves as part of the control mechanism for the rest of the body. Cognition, any kind of thinking cannot be properly understood without referring to the body it serves. The key to achieving fantastic levels of effectiveness is to work with our biology. We may all be capable of impressive feats of comprehension, motivation, emotional control, problem solving, creativity, and decision making when our biological systems are functioning optimally. But we can be terrible at those very same things when our biological systems are suboptimal. The amount of exercise and sleep we get and the food we eat can greatly influence these mental functions in the short term, even within hours. The mental functions we engage in just prior to tackling a task can also have a powerful effect on whether we accomplish that task. Strategy 1. Recognize your decision points. 
Most of the time, we function in automatic mode, we think, feel, and act following non-conscious routines. Non-conscious refers to anything the mind or brain does that is not conscious. It doesn't mean to say that our behavior is thoughtless, it is simply well-learned and well-rehearsed, and thus requires little conscious monitoring. If you start checking your email a few minutes after arriving at the office, you might not even realize that after you finish opening, reading, and answering your first email, you reflexively move on to the next, and the next. And the next, perhaps until you are interrupted by a colleague who has come to grab you for lunch. Much of what we do each day is automatic and guided by habit, requiring little conscious awareness, and that's not a bad thing. As Duhigg explains, our habits are necessary mental energy savers. We need to relieve our conscious minds so we can solve new problems as they come up. Once we've solved the puzzle of how to ballroom dance, for example, we can do it by habit, and so be mentally freed to focus on a conversation while dancing instead. The first strategy for creating a couple of awesome hours of productivity is very simple. This strategy is to learn to recognize the few moments during each day when you have the opportunity and ability to choose how you spend your time. These moments are when a task ends or is interrupted, say, you are done with a phone call, and you must choose the next task you are going to engage in, should you answer an email or prepare for a meeting? We all get lost in a trance when we are going through the motions of a neural routine. Merriam-Webster's Dictionary describes a trance in one of its definitions as a state in which you are not aware of what is happening around you because you are thinking of something else. If you are preparing for a presentation, you may be unaware of the two colleagues standing a short distance from your cubicle. If you are engrossed in reading a report, you might not notice that you are hungry or that it is time for lunch. While the neural routine is running, there is less self-awareness and less awareness of what's happening outside the routine. But when the routine ends, e.g., when you finish flossing your teeth or reading the report or is interrupted by someone or something, e.g., when a colleague interrupts your presentation preparations to ask your advice on another project, self-awareness ramps up. The transition from being deeply engaged in the neural routine to the routine stopping can be jarring. Decision points, thus, often arise as a result of conflict, a conflict between automatic behaviors, or between behaviors and goals. We may find ourselves pulled in many directions in these moments. Because decision points often arise from conflict, they can be unpleasant. How to maximize your decision points. When you reach a decision point, either when you start your workday or when you complete a task and feel, even for a split second, that sudden unpleasant moment of confusion about what to do next, you have an opportunity on your hands. You can kick your self-conscious processing mechanisms into high gear to make good decisions about how to use this time on what matters to you most. There are three tricks to maximizing these decision points. Savor each decision point. Plan your decision points in advance. Don't start a new task without consciously deciding it's the right one. Savor each decision point. A decision point doesn't come around that often in the day, and you can't always know when one will come. But this is the moment when you can willfully choose a new direction and, therefore, each one is precious. A decision point is to be savored, it is to be honored. By honoring, I mean recognizing when you are experiencing one and seizing it. I mean allowing the decision point to happen rather than ignoring it and pushing ahead, onto the next task that your non-conscious processes nudge you toward. I mean taking a step back, reconnecting with what matters to you, and then deciding what the best next course of action is. Plan your decision points in advance. Interruptions and distractions are inevitable. Even with the most careful planning, our tasks are often disrupted by an urgent email or phone call or by a colleague who pops by with just a quick question. We may not know exactly when, but we know there's a high probability that these interruptions will happen. Every one of them creates a decision point. Why wait until they occur unexpectedly to plan how you are going to respond to them? When caught off guard by an interruption, you are more likely to react rather than savor the decision point it has created. You are more likely to let your non-conscious mind quickly guide what task to tackle next, rather than taking the time to make a conscious, strategic choice, and that could mean wasting tons of time. Planning the reactions, we will have to our decision points before they happen allows us to maximize them in our time. Don't start a new task without consciously deciding it's the right one. When you hit a decision point, quickly starting on the next task often leads to more wasted time than taking a few minutes to decide properly what that next task should be. The key is to seize the decision point moment. 
Here's how, first, as soon as you finish a task, rather than thinking about what you can do easily right away, label this moment as a decision point. For example, when the author hangs up the phone after a 45-minute coaching session, he literally says to himself, this is a decision point, that's enough to trigger him to pause. He sometimes even stands up and walk away from his computer or drink some water or coffee. Once the mental dust settles, after running at full cognitive speed for 45 minutes, he will become more capable of deciding what's worth his time to start on next. Strategy 2. Manage your mental energy. Every day is a battle of priorities. Should we handle the seemingly urgent request our colleague called us about last night? Should we respond to that new email from our top client? Or should we work on that big report due in a few days? For years, productivity experts have said that the best way to manage our time is to focus on our biggest priorities first because there may not be time later. While they are partly right, it is often helpful to get to the biggest priorities first, their advice misses an important element. Our mental energy is the fuel that drives us, or fails to drive us. Every task takes a mental toll on us, some even fatigue our minds. And perhaps every task elicits emotions that make that task and the ones that follow either harder or easier to do. While it would be nice to bring our a-game to every task we tackle, there is only so much of the right mental energy to go around. In order to create a couple of awesome hours of productivity, we're much better off choosing what's worth giving the right mental energy to and putting off, in strategic ways, those tasks on our to-do lists that get in the way. At a deeper level, being productive requires self-control because quality decisions, investments, or plans require that we deal with competing options. Whenever there are competing options, we have reasons to pursue each option, and therefore self-control is needed to say no to all but one. As Roy Baumeister and John Tierney explain in their book Willpower, people keep their options open, sometimes even at great cost and little gain, because it takes willpower to make decisions, and so the depleted state makes people look for ways to postpone or evade decisions. This link between decision-making and self-control is where things get especially interesting. Not only does it seem that as we deplete our self-control reserves for one task, but it also makes it more difficult to motivate ourselves to do well on other ones. There's evidence that other executive tasks, like decision-making, may take a toll on our self-control too. There's another way we can ensure that our brains are ready when we need to perform at our best. When we understand how the tasks on our to-do lists elicit emotions that make completing those very tasks, and the ones that follow, either harder or easier, we can plan ahead accordingly. Because being on at the right moment matters so much, saying no to tasks that will get in the way of that is key to deciding what should get our attention. Although we may not always be aware of it, many of the tasks we perform, whether we're answering a colleague's email or engaging in a tough negotiation with a supplier, elicit emotions, excitement, anger, pride, boredom, uncertainty, anxiety, and so on. The emotions can be mild or strong. And emotions have a deep effect on how well we perform. Knowing what to expect from our emotions can open up whole new opportunities for a couple of hours of awesome productivity. How to manage your mental energy. Now that you have a deeper understanding of how our brains get fatigued and how our emotions can drive us, we can apply that knowledge to set up a couple of awesome hours of productivity. The consequences of our mental energy on our abilities are real and biological. Here are a few ways to manage your mental energy when you know that you have to be at your best. Limit your mental fatigue. Most tasks, at least for professionals and knowledge workers, lead to some mental fatigue. After all, we are constantly engaging in activities that involve decision-making and self-control. The key to limiting mental fatigue is recognizing the work that is most likely to deplete your resources in a substantial way and, when you have any say in the matter, do not engage in that work until you are at your best. So how can you identify the tasks that lead to mental fatigue and keep you from being incredibly productive? If you feel spent after doing a task, there's a good chance it is tapping into your self-control. The degree to which tasks take a toll on self-control, decision-making, or other executive functions varies with each person. Here are some examples of common activities that can lead to mental fatigue, switching frequently between one task and another networking and making small talk sitting still for hours making cold calls identifying errors and correcting them planning or scheduling projects keeping track of deadlines. Practice strategic incompetence. The author advised thus far that you set up a couple of awesome hours for your most important work and save your unproductive time for everything else. 
But there are days when we'll have to choose not to do some things on our lists at all. Sometimes we may be better off letting certain things go in order to be ready when it matters most. It is better to spend two awesome hours on something with meaningful potential to bring in business or advance our careers in the long term than to have no awesome hours while trying to get to everything on the list. Many people experience much difficulty with this advice. There's a reason that everything is on our lists, and there's often another person who cares about whether each thing on the list gets done. As thoughtful and responsible people, we care about not letting others down, and we care about showing others we are competent. The toughest part is that it's not just an issue of prioritizing or knowing what matters most. It's that whenever there is a decision to make between priorities, there are always some valid reasons to try to do it all. And there are always some consequences to not doing it. But we can lose the battle to win the war. Choose your moments of peak performance and sacrifice liberally around them. To leverage your mental energy, do a few things that really matter excellently, rather than doing everything in moderation. Strategy 3. Stop fighting distractions. You can now recognize the decision points in your day, lucky you. You may realize that by choosing wisely what task to take on next, based on the levels of your mental and emotional reserves, you are well on your way to a period of awesome productivity. The next step is to make that period as effective as possible once it is underway. In other words, now you need to focus for a prolonged period of time. Although our ability to sustain attention on a task is critical for our success, finding focus, being able to maintain our attention without distraction, is a remarkably difficult thing to do. That's because our brains are actually constructed to respond to distractions. And never before have our workspaces been more distracting, shared offices, meetings, computers, smartphones, tablets, countless emails, and the internet and social media access our devices provide all vie for our attention. To stay on task, we need to master two skills. The first is obvious, to remove distractions, and to learn more about how attention works can help motivate us to take that seriously enough. The second is to let our minds wander. Don't booby trap your workplace with distractors. Our brains are distraction-finding machines, which makes focusing on a single task for long periods of time quite difficult. So what can we do to make staying focused easier? Remove the most predictable sources of distraction. Removing distractions in order to focus better may seem incredibly obvious, and it is. Just about every productivity blog post and book recommends doing so, not to mention that it is also just plain common sense. Of course, you'll be able to focus better if your colleagues are not stopping by every five minutes to say hi or ask you a question. And yet if you work in an office, then you probably know firsthand that most of us do very little to truly remove distractions from our workspaces. In fact, our work tools, computers, phones, tablets, are incredibly disruptive to the kind of work that most professionals, especially knowledge workers, need to do, think creatively, make complicated decisions, and plan and coordinate tasks. Let your mind wander. As adults, when our minds wander, when we catch ourselves drifting off in thought, say, about the game coming up this weekend or what will happen on our favorite reality TV show, or whether we remembered to leave a tip at lunch, rather than thinking about the task at hand, we apologize. If our minds wander a lot, we consider it a flaw that we need to manage, something to be embarrassed about. Research, however, suggests that mind wandering may not be a flaw after all. It may have important benefits when it comes to performing the kinds of tasks that are among the most cognitively challenging to professionals, creative problem solving and long-term planning. A UC Santa Barbara study suggests that if you want to solve a particularly dicey problem, letting your mind wander by engaging in an unrelated and cognitively easy task can help you find some creative solutions to that problem. They even found evidence that people who daydream more frequently in everyday life are generally more creative. So the next time you find your mind drifting away from a complex challenge or a problem you are trying to creatively solve rather than yell at yourself for losing your focus, just let it happen and reap the benefits of mind wandering. Strategy 4. Leverage your mind-body connection. There is no doubt that many personal attributes made Nelson Mandela capable of immense mental resilience during his years in hiding and then his decades in jail as a political prisoner. But he attributed his clarity of thought and resilience in part to his physical activity, even when he was confined to a cell day after day. In his autobiography, Mandela revealed that while he was in jail, from Monday through Thursday, he used to run in place for a maximum of 45 minutes as well as do push-ups, sit-ups, and other exercises. 
I found that I worked better and thought more clearly when I was in good physical condition, and so training became one of the inflexible disciplines of my life, Mandela wrote. There are immediate benefits of exercising, which can occur after a single session of activity, that you may not hear about from health and fitness sources and that pertains to your mental state. Even a little exercise at the right time can help you think better, stay focused, sharpen your thoughts, and reduce your anxiety, key elements of sustained productivity, in the hours that follow the physical activity. For example, one meta-analysis showed that exercising for 10 to 40 minutes has a consistent and immediate effect on improving executive functions. The term executive functions refers to the brain's various abilities to direct and override other mental activity, like prioritizing some items over others at a staff meeting or stopping your impulse to call the boss stupid in the middle of your performance review. Research suggests that physical exercise particularly enhances the executive functions that have to do with self-control. Exercise is also fantastic to reduce anxiety. A meta-analysis, analyzing results from over 100 studies, showed that aerobic exercise in the 21 to 35 minutes range was enough to reliably reduce anxious feelings in the period after exercising. And another study showed that in the longer term, exercise actually buffers against the negative effects of chronic stress. This strategy is not an argument for why you should exercise regularly for better overall health and perhaps, through that, become more productive. Rather, the author suggests that, whether or not you currently have an exercise routine, you can use physical activity at specific times in order to boost your thinking abilities and your mental energy. Here are some ways to leverage exercise well. If you are feeling mentally sluggish and unable to focus, get out of your office and move right away. Walk very briskly for 30 to 40 minutes. Go up and down the back stairs for 10 or 20 minutes. Or if you belong to a gym nearby, take a break and exercise for 20 to 30 minutes on the treadmill, exercise bike, or your preferred machine. Try to break a sweat, but don't overdo it. Whenever possible, schedule challenging or anxiety-provoking meetings when you can block out time beforehand for moderate exercise. The exercise is likely to calm your nerves and improve your mood. When there is a particularly challenging or draining task on your calendar, either exercise in the morning before it to make it easier to handle or schedule it at a time of day when you can exercise soon after it to restore your drained mental energy and improve your mood in time to tackle whatever comes next. In general, plan to work out for about 20 to 40 minutes within a couple of hours before you next need to be awesomely productive. Strategy 5. Make your workspace work for you. Like exercise, our surroundings affect our brains in meaningful ways. Learning to manipulate these surroundings so that we can operate at peak productivity levels involves understanding how and why our brains and minds react to external stimuli, and therefore how to successfully work around those stimuli. Productivity and creativity in a noisy world. Is it better or worse to listen to music while working? What about white noise? Sometimes we don't want to work but have to, so we may decide to work in front of a TV to make ourselves at least feel better about it. Are we just fooling ourselves into thinking we can work in noisy environments? I have bad news and good news. The bad news is that researchers have found that environmental noise, background music, city sounds, people's conversations, leads to a decrease in performance for most people. The good news is that this represents an easy way to make changes that can set us up for being highly effective. Of the different sources of noise, there is one that turns out to be the hardest to tune out. Intermittent speech is particularly challenging to ignore. Intermittent speech is when you hear a few words or sentences here and there with pauses in between. Like when colleagues who sit in the cubicles behind you turn and ask each other questions, or when someone else is on a phone call listening for a while and then speaking periodically. Intermittent speech is also one of the most common sounds in an office. One meta-analysis examined 242 studies on how noise affects performance and found that when it came to performing cognitive tasks, like staying attentive, reading and processing text, and working with numbers, performance was more affected by intermittent speech than by either continuous speech which would have little variation in volume and rhythm or non-speech noise. These are some basic things you can do to help you stay focused when it's important to be on, if your office has a door, close it. If you don't have a private office, reserve a conference room or set up camp somewhere that is largely free of noise and other potential distractions. A place with privacy that is away from noise distractions will be more favorable to productivity. If your desk is in a shared space and you must stay there, put noise-canceling headphones on. 
Those little squishy orange earplugs can sometimes do the trick too, and you can take them anywhere. You may look weird, but you'll be more productive. Don't listen to music or talk radio. If you are working at home, turn off the TV. If you are working at home, turn off the TV. If you're taking on a task that requires lots of creativity, enjoy background noise. You may actually consider heading for the company's busy cafeteria or a local coffee shop, or putting on a little music. If your office has a door, close it. If you don't have a private office, reserve a conference room or set up camp somewhere that is largely free of noise and other potential distractions. A place with privacy that is away from noise distractions will be more favorable to productivity. The effects of light on productivity. Noise is not the only environmental factor that deeply affects your productivity. Another stimulus, which you can often control, is light. The reason light matters is because our eyes are not just for vision. In 2002, a discovery made at Brown and Johns Hopkins Universities revolutionized how we think about our eyes. Up to that point, only two kinds of cells in the retina had been shown to respond to light, rods, and cones, which we rely on for vision. However, another cell type was demonstrated to respond to light as well, but for a non-visual purpose. These cells connect to a part of the brain responsible for maintaining circadian rhythms. They respond especially well to light at the blue end of the visual spectrum, like the light of the sky on a clear blue day. For example, there is research that suggests that white light enriched with blue may help you feel more alert and think more clearly. Bluish white light has also been shown to enhance self-control and the ability to mentally rotate objects, which is an ability important in engineering, design, and many of the scientific and technical fields. Consider these tips when you want to be at your best, turn on more lights. A brightly lit room is better for being at your mental best than a darker one, especially if it's a cloudy day or the middle of winter. If you have to bring your own lamp to the office. If you can, be somewhere with ambient natural light on a day with clear blue skies, and set yourself up to work there. Consider replacing the current light bulbs in your workspace with white lights that include more of the blue spectrum, even if it's just at your desk lamp. Research suggests there's a good chance you'll activate your eye's retinal photoreceptor cells that communicate with your brain's circadian clock, helping you stay more alert. Dim your lights a bit or find a spot that's a little darker than usual when you want to work on a project that requires creativity. Conclusion I've never met a person who didn't lament the fact that they can't seem to get enough done. We're all overwhelmed with work and life demands. And up until now, most people have responded to this by turning their attention to how to be more efficient. How can I get rid of unnecessary downtime? How can I get my people to put in more hours at work each week? How can I move from task to task, or even multitask, so there's not even one wasted moment? It turns out we've been barking up the wrong tree. Efficiency is a metric for machines and computers. But science is revealing that humans are not just computers on life support. We have brains and bodies, and we operate according to biological needs. The right metric for human performance is effectiveness, not efficiency. Our brains can be remarkably effective under the right conditions and not so effective under the wrong ones. Neuroscience and psychology reveal what those conditions are and how we can set ourselves up for highly effective mental performance. Some of the tasks recommended for mind-wandering include, appreciating a piece of art on the wall, a plant in the room, the view out the window, or photographs on your desk, and noticing the different shades of color, straightening up your desk, organizing your bookshelf, or cleaning up the whiteboard, straightening up your desk, organizing your bookshelf, or cleaning up the whiteboard, listening to music and noticing all the different instruments in the piece you are listening to, or playing a little game, such as making a mark on a piece of paper every time you see someone walking while texting. These tasks require a little thinking, but not much. And they don't require much working memory, they don't require you to hold much information in mind while you work through that information.